All right. So the next experiment deals with melting points, right? What's a melting point? Well, that's something you would have talked about probably in grade school and junior high and high school. And you definitely talked about melting points in, um, in general chemistry. It's the conversion of a solid to a liquid. So that's what we're looking at in this experiment. And we're going to take a look at experiment 3.3C, and we're going to look at exercise C2. This is an artifact. We're actually going to scratch um, exercise C3. If you wanted to discuss exercise C3 with your instructor in the lab, feel free to do that. So we're going to take a look at 3.3C, um, so 3.3C, which is the determination of the effect of structure on melting points. That's going to um, uh, it's going to um, force you to remember some of your general chemistry, uh, intermolecular forces, and then in exercise C2, you're actually going to identify an unknown uh, from a list of unknowns that's on page 27 in the lab manual. So really in the first part, you're going to hone your melting point skills, so to speak, and then in the second part, you're going to use your newfound skills to be able to identify an unknown just by looking at its melting point. All right, so what are we doing? Again, 3.3C deals with melting point and how structures and properties of those structures, uh, relationships can affect melting points. So be sure to read all of technique C in the lab manual. That's the Schaff Saw book, okay? For all the theory and background information. In fact, I would always recommend reading that before you come to before you come to lab lecture. Not only can you find information about how structure um, affects uh, melting point, you could also find some information about that in chapter one of Klein. Now, most of you are currently enrolled in chemistry 3101. And if you remember in chapter one, we spent some time talking about intermolecular forces and I'll mention those again today. So. This is a lab where you have to apply some of your general chemistry knowledge and you have to use it in an organic chemistry class, right? Chemistry is an additive subject in a lot of ways. What you learn in general chemistry, you can't just, you know, forget that after you've taken it. You have to remember things like intermolecular forces, how, how to calculate a percent yield, right? Things like that, balanced equations, stoichiometry. You need to be able to apply those skills in organic chemistry. So again, in the first part, 3.3C, you're going to be asked to rank four different compounds um, in terms of their melting points, but you're going to base those actual measured melting points on their physical properties. And you need to be able to understand and determine why melting point trends exist. So melting point, again, it occurs when molecules in the solid phase acquire enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces or intermolecular attractions that bind them together in an orderly crystalline lattice. Now, if you go back to your general chemistry, you probably would have learned about the body centered cubic and the face centered cubic crystal and then the simple cubic crystal, of course. But in organic chemistry, we're not really gonna be talking about those crystals, so to speak. But when we have a crystalline compound in organic chemistry, um, the molecules will be ordered together or, or, or be bound together in the solid phase in an orderly fashion. So we do get a repeating pattern, a crystalline lattice. But the crystal lattice will differ based on the structure of the compound. It can also differ just based off of the um, intermolecular forces between the compounds. Now, what about melting? If we go to melt an organic compound, what happens? It says here that melting doesn't actually occur instantaneously because first the molecule needs to absorb enough energy to penetrate the crystal and then physically um, disrupt or break those intermolecular forces or attractions between the molecules. And because melting point doesn't occur instantaneously, it actually occurs over a range. And so what you will be recording in the lab will be melting point ranges. So it says here that typically the outside of a crystal, so if we have an organic compound, and you can even just imagine it, if you're like, what's a crystal, Mr. Dion? You mean like a crystal vase? No. I mean, you could even imagine it as a cube, okay? You could have an organic compound that's, you know, maybe has um, a cubic crystal in structure. But if you just think about that compound and you start to irradiate that compound with heat or you start to heat that compound, well, the outside of the crystal should melt faster, right? The outside should melt faster than the inside because it's going to take time for the heat to penetrate, right, to get into the inside of the crystal. You can't imagine an ice cube melting from the outside in. You always think about an ice cube melts from the outside and then 
Uh, what does it say? Imagine an ice cube melting from the outside in. That should say from the inside out. Anyhow. Or no, sorry, this is not a joke. Okay, anyhow. Imagine an ice cube and it melts from the outside in. Anyhow. Uh, there you go. So melting points, as I said, since a melting point starts when the outside begins to melt and then the heat has to penetrate the entire crystal, again, melting points are ranges. So what you're actually going to record in the lab when you're using the melting point apparatus, and I'll talk more about that later on, what the apparatus looks like, you're going to start recording the melting point when you first see the organic compound start to melt. Now, if you're wondering, what does it look like when it starts to melt, Mr. Beyond? We're going to get into that. But as soon as you see the first drops of liquid start to form, that's when the melting point is, begins. Then you're going to have two phases. You're going to have the liquid phase and you're going to have some solid phase, right? But once all the solid phase has disappeared, as soon as it disappears, you look at the melting point and you say, that's the upper limit of my melting point, okay? And so it is a range that you'll record. All right. A melting point is a physical property of an organic compound. So what are other physical properties? Boiling points, of course. Density. You know, if you go back to um, high school, you would think about physical properties as being maybe a luster or hardness or things like that. Maybe if you study, you know, geology or something of that. Else. Anyhow, and we'll look at other physical properties this semester, probably some new ones like refractive index, but that's for another lab lecture. Now, what can a melting point be used for? It can be used um, for the identification of an unknown. Okay, if you have an unknown, and what I mean by an unknown is an unknown organic compound that has already been discovered. Or newly discovered? No, just an organic compound that we are already, that the scientific community is already fully aware of and it's already been characterized by scientists. That's what we refer to as an unknown. A melting point can also be an indicator of compound purity, and that is directly related to melting point range. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But what a melting point cannot be used for is for the identification of a known known. I'm telling you. If you were to ask a scientist, you know, somebody who's practiced organic chemistry for a long time, could I use a melting point to identify a new compound? It would be ridiculous, okay? Can you use a melting point in conjunction with other data? And um, we haven't gotten into things like spectroscopy and spectrometry yet, but there's a difference between an unknown and a new compound. A new compound would be something that's never been synthesized before, something, something that nobody has ever made before in the lab. And believe me, people around this country, all day, every day, researchers are designing new molecules all the time. Thousands of molecules every day that have never been made by humans um, are, being, um, are being synthesized. And so um, if you were to just take the melting point of a compound that's never been made before, it doesn't really give you any information. And you wouldn't be able to identify a compound based on its melting point. Now, if you're saying, does that mean the melting point of a new compound isn't important? Of course, it's important, okay? Um, but you wouldn't be able to use it to identify a brand new compound that's never been discovered before. All right, there we go. Well, let's talk a little bit more about melting point and that whole range uh, concept. Now, why do we have ranges in melting points, okay? Something that you're going to see in this lab is that when you write down a melting point, so you'll put melting point, let's say it's, you know, so many hundred point, you know, something degrees Celsius, and then that's going to be the lower part. That's when it starts to melt, okay? And then you're going to have a range, and you're going to report a higher temperature, and that's going to be where the solid stops melting, right? That's when it's, or not ends, I should say, completely melted, but you understand what I'm saying. So why do we record melting points as a range, or sorry, um, why do we have a range is what I wanted to address here. Well, the reason why is because melt, uh, impurities, or there's a couple of reasons, but anyhow, impurities can affect the melting point range in a couple of ways, okay? First of all, it says melting point depression. If we look at that melting point range, oftentimes the more impurities we have, the lower number of the range will drop. So if we have more impurities, that number will drop even more. And broadening, what about the range in between the lower and upper melting point range numbers or, or uh, values. Um, it says here that often the lower end drops significantly and the higher end less so. But again, it stands to reason that if I have more impurities, 
and the lower range drops even more. That means that the more impure my sample is, the greater the range. Okay, so the basically the take home message from this slide for you guys is that the more impure my sample is, the broader the range is going to be. Now, you might be able to connect the dots and say, well, does that mean the more pure my sample is, right? The greater the purity, does that mean that my narrow or my melting point is going to be uh, narrowed and less done? And the answer would be absolutely. Okay. Now, if we're measuring a melting point, if you're physically taking a melting point in the lab, it's going to be you all by yourself. It's pretty hard for, for people to work in, in partners when they measure melting points. And the reason why is because you have an instrument set aside for yourself. You know, you're sitting there on a stool and you're watching this instrument carefully, watching the solid organic compound, watching the temperature increase, waiting for it to start melting, right? It's a, it's a game of patience in some ways. Well, what kind of errors would be associated with melting point range, right? You heard me talk about the compound begins to melt. Well, you know, when does it begin to melt exactly, okay? Um, so there could be some perception errors. You know, when one person sees liquid start to form might be slightly different. Now, I'm not talking about multiple degrees, but it might be slightly different than what another person sees. Other errors that can arise can be just in the way you make a sample. So it's not just about throwing some organic compound into the instrument and then checking the melting point. You actually have to prepare the sample correctly. And we're gonna explain to you, or I'm gonna explain to you in this lab lecture about sample size, so how to get the right amount of sample, how to pack it properly, and then finally, how to actually manipulate the instrument such that the heating ramp rate is appropriate based on whether you're running a known compound or an unknown compound or a pure compound or an impure compound. Okay, so you can see, you, you know, you hear the title or you hear the, the subject of this lab lecture in the first slide, you hear melting point. You think, oh, what am I going to do, melt something? How difficult is that? Well, the physical act of melting something, of course, the instrument's going to do the work. But understanding, right, that's what I want you to do. I want you to understand, you know, what's going on in the lab. So let's get into that, what you might see in the lab. And there's some really uh, good pictures here. These are taken by a colleague of mine. Uh, now, the, the sample that you're going to pack is going to be in a little tiny capillary tube. Now, for the students who have done the TLC lab, you've seen the little glass capillary tubes that we use to draw up an aliquot. To, which just means a small liquid sample to put on the TLC plate. Well, the melting point capillary tubes that we use are actually not much bigger. Okay, they're not much bigger than those tubes. They may even be maybe the same size, but I think they're a little bit bigger. So this is obviously not to scale. Okay, this is a magnified picture of what the sample looks like. But you can see that somebody packed some organic compound in here. It looks like it's a white salt, the black and white photo, but it looks like it's a nice white solid. So at this point, the scientist might be heating up the sample, but no melting has begun. Okay, nothing's even starting. Well, when are you going to start recording that melting point range? As soon as you start to see the first liquid drops, that's when you're going to record your initial melting point, right? That's the first number in the range. Then you're going to have um, a mixture. You're going to have two phases, right? Uh, you're going to have the liquid phase and the solid phase together. Okay, and as the sample absorbs heat, the temperature is going to rise. Then you're going to get to a point where you see something over here where you can clearly see we have a mixture of liquid phase and we have the solid phase. And then as soon as all the solid phase has disappeared, that is going to be your final melting point. Okay, so the range again starts and you start to see liquid and it ends when all the solid is completely melted. Now, again, that might seem like, wow, Mr. DM, that doesn't seem very difficult. Well, you'll see that it can get more challenging um, depending on the situation. Anyhow, let's talk about impurities a little bit more because I told you that if you have an impurity, impurities actually disrupt the crystal lattice so that less energy is required to disrupt the intermolecular forces between the molecules. So if we think about a pure compound, and if you were to take a pure compound, say a compound that you bought from a chemical supplier, those compounds display little, or usually little, if any, melting point range. So, as I said before, the purer your compound is, the sharper your melting point range is going to be. So, what's the connection I'm drawing here? Is that the narrower your melting point range is, the purer your compound will be. 
again, if we have a very pure compound, let's say something again that we buy from a chemical supplier, oftentimes those will have melting point ranges very sharp in the range of one to two or maybe even three degrees. But very narrow ranges are a good indication of purity, of having a pure compound. Um, it's impossible to raise the melting point of an already pure substance because if the substance is totally pure, right? Let's say it's 99.99% pure, then there's no, there's nothing that you could add to it that would increase the melting point. If you added anything to it that was not the actual compound itself, it's only going to serve to disrupt the crystal lattice, right? It's going to break up the continuity, okay, of that crystal lattice, and therefore it's going to depress the melting point. Next, it says mixtures of substances. Um, uh, so contamination of one compound by another can be incorporated into the crystal lattice. Um, melting point depression and broadening. So again, when we have an impurity in our sample, it's going to cause broadening and depression. So again, if we have an impure compound, not only is the melting point going to be broadened, but we see a melting point depression. Now, why would it be depressed? Same old thing that I just said, okay? If we have a crystal that's perfectly packed together, something that's perfectly pure, if we put impurities in that crystal, what's it gonna do? It's only gonna weaken that crystal. So if it takes less energy, right, less heat to melt it, it's gonna melt at a lower temperature. And it's all, you know, it all kind of goes together. All right, so, just, I'm kind of repeating it here and driving the, the point home a little bit, but it bears repeating that melting points are depressed by contaminations that, again, weaken the crystal lattice, but uh, melting points are never raised. Um, it says here, even when two chemicals with the same melting point are mixed, the melting point will be broadened and depressed. Now, this is kind of an interesting example, and the book goes into a little more detail on this and make sure that you read the book, but let's say you had compound A, Compound A, which has a melting point of, I don't know, 151 degrees Celsius. And let's say you have compound B, compound B, which has a melting point of 151 degrees Celsius. Okay? Now, just because both of these compounds have the same melting point, if you were to make, let's say, a 50-50 mixture of these two compounds, or really any kind of mixture of these two compounds, and you were to measure the melting point, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to say, come on, Mr. Dion, they both melt at 151, so it's, if you mix them together, it's going to melt at 151. Not true at all. Why wouldn't that be true? Because even though they have the same melting point, just because two organic compounds have the same melting point doesn't mean they're the same compounds. They even gave them different names, A and B. They're two different compounds. They just happen to require the same amount of thermal energy to break their crystal lattices. So if I mix the two together, if they both have different crystal lattices and if they have different structures, then they're both going to act as an impurity to each other, right? And so what that's going to do is that's going to weaken both of the crystal lattices and it's going to cause the melting point to be broadened and depressed. It's going to lower it. It's going to take less energy to break that crystal or those crystals apart. Something that we're going to do later on, and this won't be until March, is we're going to do an experiment where we do what's called a recrystallization. Now, I'm not going to spend the rest of the lab lecture going over recrystallization. That's a long topic. But when we um, use recrystallization, that is a technique that's used to purify a compound. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to purify a compound. Now, how do you purify that compound? You purify it by dissolving it in a solvent. Okay? That's one of the steps. Now, I'm not going to go into all the steps of recrystallization. But since you're purifying it, by putting it in a solvent, when you isolate the crystals, you use what's called a vacuum filtration, and that's to suck away all of the solvent. But you can imagine that traces of solvent could remain behind, especially if it's a solvent that's non-volatile, right? Something that has a has a low vapor pressure. And so, um, if you isolate crystals of an organic compound through recrystallization, it's really important that you let the crystal dry for. Um, enough time so that all the solvent can, has time to escape the crystal lattice, okay? because uh, the solvent can actually um, uh, cause the melting point to be broadened and depressed. Right? It can weaken that crystal lattice. Okay, It's not completely dry. What else? I told you uh, 
that if we take two compounds that have the same melting point and we mix them together, we're not going to get the same melting point. It also says here that the melting point of two chemicals will not be the average of the two mixed together. Let's say we have, you know, compound, uh, we'll call this one compound X and compound Y. If we have compound uh, X that has a melting point of, let's say, 130 degrees Celsius, and compound Y, which has a melting point of 200 degrees Celsius, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, if I mix those two together, then the mixture is going to have a melting point. So mixture melting point is going to be equal to 130 plus 200, you know, divided by 2, which gives me 165. There we go, hot diggity there. No, okay, not at all. It doesn't work that way. It, it's not going to be an average of the two. So it's not that simple. You can't just do a little quick calculation like that and anticipate what the melting point will be. Now let's get into a little bit more details about what you might see in the lab, because this is usually what intimidates students the most. They say, okay, Mr. Dion, I watched your lab lecture. I read the book. I read, you know, I read a little bit of chapter one about intermolecular forces, London forces, dipole forces, hydrogen bonding. I think I understand the theory, but I still haven't melted anything yet. What's it, what am I going to see? Well, the next two slides are put in here to kind of, you know, uh, lower your blood pressure a little bit and just kind of show you a little bit more detail of what you might see in the lab, okay? Now, this is a sample of ibuprofen that was uh, taken from a commercial tablet. So, um, and these pictures were taken by a former colleague, or sorry, a colleague of mine. And uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you that you're not going to use this kind of instrument. You're not going to be looking at a glass thermometer, okay? You're going to have a digital instrument, but I think the glass thermometer works great for, um, for lab lecture purposes because you can see that um, you can clearly see what's going on here on the thermometer. Anyhow, let's walk through these bullet points here. It says, before the melting point starts, you might see the sample shrink in size or the glass uh, capillary might fog. We call that sweating. That's not melting. Again, that is usually from if there's any water trapped inside the crystal or if the, wa if the crystal maybe just absorbed water from air or if there's some residual solvent from a crystallization. That's what we call sweating. When the melting point starts, you're going to have little droplets of liquid form, and the crystal will oftentimes appear to shrink away from the sides of the tube, so it looks like it's getting a little bit smaller. Now, if you're wondering, you know, Mr. Dion, how am I going to know the difference between fogging or sweating and shrinking when it's actually melting? Trust me that once you get into the lab and you actually melt a compound, it's, it will become more abundantly clear. When you actually melt it, you'll know when you're seeing fogging and when you're actually seeing melting. It's, it's, it's not that unapparent, okay? It's quite apparent. Now, you see that the, the mercury or alcohol in the thermometer is right at, so here's 65, and this is 70, 71, 72. So it looks like it's right at 72.0 degrees Celsius. Somebody missed a sig fig here. Anyhow, it looks like it's right at 72 degrees Celsius, so that would be, the, the, the beginning of my melting point range, All right? These are things you'd include in your observation, you know, what you're seeing, uh, what color the compound is, what it looks like when it starts to melt, the initial, um, the initial um, melting point of the range. Then you can see here that once we get to 73 degrees Celsius, so we have 70, 71, 72, 73, 73.0. Uh, somebody here is stingy with the sig figs, but anyhow, um, you see, you can clearly see that there's some liquid in here. Okay, it's progressing. Then, if you look at 74 degrees Celsius, so this this is 75 degrees Celsius, we get 74, 74.0 degrees Celsius. We actually have a mixture. Now, it might not be abundantly clear by looking at this picture, but this is a mixture. It's like a slush. You know, you've got solid in there, and it's uh, dispersed in the liquid. So you have a mixture here of solid and liquid. And then once you get to the very end, you can clearly see that there's no solid here, right? You see that it's all melted and we're at what? We're at around 75.0 degrees Celsius. And so where does the 72.4 come? Where does the 0.4 come? I'm not sure where the 0.4 comes from. Maybe I just can't see this properly. But anyhow, whatever. Good enough, close enough. Anyhow, so 72.4 to 75.0 uh, degrees Celsius. And again, your instrument that you're going to use to measure your melting point is digital. And so 
You don't have to estimate any sig fig, so it's something to help you there. Now, if you compare the literature value for um, the melting point of ibuprofen, and this comes from the Merck Index, and you can search the Merck Index online through the Kramer Library, you see the range is 75 to 77 degrees Celsius. You notice that the results from the experiment that was done on the last three or four slides is 72.4 to 75. Why is there a difference between the values? First of all, I noticed that the range here is a little bit greater, right? The range here is around, well, it is two degrees Celsius, whereas the range here is 2.6 degrees Celsius. So it's broadened. And also, if you see the upper point and the lower, they're both depressed. What does that suggest? It, it suggests that the sample of ibuprofen from, um, from the, uh, from the sample is probably impure. It probably has some impurities, all right? That's why I have a difference in my values. Now notice that, it, um, and, and this is a question I've been asked before during lab lecture. I was looking through my old notes or whatever, and somebody asked a really, you know, astute question. Um, they said, well, what about vapor, vapor pressure, right? We're in Colorado Springs. Doesn't that affect the melting point? Well, if you go back to your general chemistry, you would have learned that Atmospheric pressure affects gases, but it doesn't affect solids and liquids. And so when we report a melting point of an organic compound, of any compound, we don't have to report anything about the temperature, right? Um, or, or sorry, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, because the atmospheric pressure is not going to have an effect on the melting point. All right, here's what it looks like when you make the sample. Now, this is something that takes a little bit of practice. Um, it says here you load the capillary tube. This is the capillary tube. Right here, it's just a thin glass tube. We have, you know, enough in the lab, enough for everybody. Anyhow, it's a thin glass tube. And the way that Mr. Mayer puts the samples out in the lab might be a little bit different. This is an older photo. But um, literally all the, all the student or scientist is doing, you can see the, this is the gloved hand right here. All the scientist is doing is taking the inverted capillary tube and just putting it, poking it into the solid. And enough solid will go into the open end and it'll get stuck in there, okay? Now, how do you prepare this, the, the solid sample? Because you need it as a powder. If it was a crystal, like an actual crystal, you might have to crush it using a mortar and pestle or a spatula. But I think that the samples in our lab are prepared ahead of time, so, or just the, the, the crystals are prepared ahead of time so that you don't need to crush anything like that, okay? Um, another good way to... Um, make a sample for a melting point is just to take a little bit of solid and put it on a watch glass. So if you remember the watch glass from your general chemistry, right, because it's big and open and you can just kind of poke the capillary into that and then you invert it and uh, you, you let the compound fall down to the bottom. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, you want to have around two to three millimeters of the sample. Now, I used to think that everybody knew what two to three millimeters meant until I started teaching this class. So if you need to get a ruler and measure, you know, this is this is a one centimeter here, right? So this is five millimeters. So this would be two to three millimeters, somewhere in that range. If you need to get a ruler out and measure it, by all means, go ahead and do that. Now, if you're wondering, now come on, Mr. Dean, if I poke a glass tube into a solid, how is it going to get down to the bottom of the capillary tube where the closed end is? And the answer is, well, you can just kind of tap it on the bench, and sometimes you can let gravity and a little bit of vibration do the magic. But if it is stubborn, what you can do is you can use a long glass tube. Now, it's not evident from this picture, but here's a long glass tube. And what you do is you take your sample. This is the capillary tube at the top. Okay, I'll highlight it in green. You can see the organic compound is right here. It's stuck at the top. So what the scientist does is she or he drops the tube and gravity, and you let it fall down. The tube is maybe, I don't know, two feet long or two and a half feet long or something. And you see that now the sample is down at the bottom like that. Okay. So we have all kinds of different uh, or a couple different ways to get the sample down in there. And believe me, it's not that difficult. So again, you want to have the sample down in the bottom of the capillary, packed nice and tight, not too tight, but you want to have it packed close together and you want to have two to three millimeters. Your sample should look something like this. Now you can see the capillary tube compared to the size. Let me get a different color here. You can see the size of a capillary tube compared to the width of a ruler. So you can see the capillary tube is not very large. And what's one of the 
great things about this lab is that we don't have to use a lot of organic compounds. A lot of students can do this lab without us wasting um, much uh, compound. So pretty nice in that regard. All right, here again, here's a picture that was taken by one of my colleagues. It shows some different sample sizes. This is kind of like Goldilocks and the three capillary tubes. You know, you look at the first one and there's not enough melting point, or sorry, not enough sample to properly observe the melting point. You'd probably get some erroneous results there. It might be difficult to tell what's going on here. There's just way too, way too darn much. But if you look at this one, um, not only is the height right, this is between the two to three millimeter, two to three millimeter range, but it also looks to me like it's packed more efficiently. Right? You look like these ones and it's got some more junk on the top. This one looks like maybe it's a little cleaner. It might be my imagination, but anyhow. So it's not just about melting. It's also about sample preparation and getting that correct. All right. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? You heard me say probably four times already during this lab lecture, I said, well, if you have a crystal and you put an impurity in it, it disrupts the crystal lattice so that it takes less energy to disrupt, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, I kept saying that. Well, here's a picture, okay? Let's imagine this is a perfectly pure organic compound, just one type of molecule, right? Think of Ikea furniture. When they pack up furniture at Ikea, they don't mix chairs with tables and then with sofas and then with pillows and then a bookshelf. No, they take one type of furniture, they pack it up and then they stack them all together, right? When you go into the big warehouse or whatever, all the furniture of one type is together, of another type is together. Why? Because that's the most efficient way to pack it. Now, some pieces of furniture, say for example, a bookshelf, they can probably pack that in, you know, maybe a rectangular shape or something which might pack more efficiently than if they're trying to pack chairs. But when you use like pieces of furniture, they're gonna pack more efficiently than if you mix them is what I'm trying to get at. So here's our organic compound. Everything is nice and, and packed. You know, it's a good packing arrangement. This represents a pure solid. What happens if we have an impure solid? Then we have impurities in there. Is there still some efficient packing? Sure, yeah, yeah, there's, there's still packing. There's still intermolecular forces. You can see that the, the actual molecules are interacting with each other. But since these impurities are not identical to the compound, they disrupt the crystal lattice. Imagine, I mean, we could sit here and come up with analogies all day, but imagine, just imagine trying to break this. You know, if you had a bunch of boxes, I don't know, all stacked together, and if you were to try to break those with a hammer, you know, when they're more efficiently packed, it's going to be more difficult to push that over than if you have a bunch of, you know, basketballs thrown in there in between them. They're going to not be packed as efficiently. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the concept of packing, efficient packing in a pure solid versus less efficient packing when we have impurities in a crystal lattice. That's a really important concept that I want you to understand when you walk into the lab. Good, great, I'm happy to see that. I don't want you to walk into the lab and say, oh, what was going on? He didn't mention impurities, okay? We didn't talk about melting point depression and broadening. No, we did. Anyhow, here are the melting point apparatuses that we use in our lab. If you read the lab manual, it's, um, the lab manual was published a number of years ago and he talks about some different melting point apparatuses, like the kind that I used when I was an undergraduate student. The ones that we have in our lab at UCCS, they're called Digimelts. They're great instruments, uh, really, really nice instruments. So nice, anybody can use them, okay? So if you're thinking by the end of this lab lecture, you're like, Mr. Dion, you didn't go over all the instructions for the Digimelt. Well, I got some good news for you. The instructions are right here on the Digimelt. So you can literally read them off the instrument. Now, it says here that there's 18 total. I don't think Mr. Mayer has 18 out in the lab currently because of uh, social distancing uh, um, guidelines. But previously, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, we did have 18 in the lab. But now I'm pretty sure we have enough so that each student, each one of the nine students can have a, 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 a Digimelt to themselves, okay? So you have your own instrument. And so here's what the Digimelt looks like. The instructions, again, are right on the instrument. This is a viewing lens here. So this is where you're actually gonna be focusing on and watching your compounds melt. Here's the screen where you can see the melting point. It would be here. And these are the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Buttons. So here's the buttons here. You can see we have start temperature that you can set it up with. 
You have a ramp rate. That's how many degrees Celsius per minute um, the heating will ramp at. Then you have a stop temperature. And you can record those on the instrument itself. So if you're not fast enough to go to your lab notebook, you can literally record them in the instrument and then go back and toggle through them. If you look, if you were to take your eyeball and, you know, you're used to looking at Newman projections, so you're used to me drawing the, the human eyeball. So if you look at an if you're looking down at the instrument in this direction, this is what you see. You see here's the eyepiece right here. You see there's three little holes. And so technically you could put in three capillaries. You could put one here, one here, and one here. Generally speaking in this class, we're gonna to stick to one capillary at a time. Here are, the, here are the instructions. I'm not gonna go over the instructions because if I go over them now, you're gonna forget them by the time you get to the lab. So make sure you take a look at them before you go to the lab and make sure you follow them when you get to the lab, okay? I can use a DigiMail. If I can use it, anybody can use it, okay? Mr. Dion's not the most tech-savvy guy out there. Anyhow, so let's go here. What are we gonna do? You're gonna load your sample into the DigiMail. You're gonna have a different, slightly different procedure depending on whether you have a, a compound that you know the identity versus a compound that you have no idea what the heck the identity is, right? And that's part of this experiment, is determining the identity of an unknown. So if you have a, a compound that you know the identity of, it's going to depend on whether you're doing a pure or an impure sample, what the heck you're going to do. If you have a compound and you know going in, okay, you walk into the instrumentation room, you, it's just you versus the digital. If you know the compound is impure, this is what you would do. You'd heat it rapidly to try to minimize the experiment time until you're about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius below the expected melting point. Re remember, this is a compound that you know what, the, what it should melt at. Why would you heat it rapidly to 10 to 15 degrees below? Because if it's impure, the melting point is gonna be broadened and depressed. Right? So you wouldn't wanna get the, the instrument too close to the actual melting point. Then once you get within 10, that 10 to 15 degree range of the melting point, then you slow it down. Okay, you're going to slow it down to one to two degrees Celsius per minute in order to take your melting point. If you had a compound that you, again, you knew the identity, you know what the melting point is, you know that it's pure, but you want to take a melting point. In that case, you'd still heat it rapidly, but you'd heat it until you get a lot closer, five degrees Celsius below the expected melting point. Then you do the same thing. Okay, you slow down the rate, take it nice and slow. Okay. Now, if you have an unknown sample, and that's what you're going to do, in the lab, you're going to have an unknown sample. You have no idea what the melting point is. If you go to page 27 in your lab text, I'm doing that right now, you'll see table I, I think it's IC1 is the table. Yeah, it's table 1C-1. It says melting points of selected organic compounds. That is the list of organic compounds you're going to look at. Again, I'm on page 27 in the lab text. You'll see that the melting points range from 48 to 184 degrees Celsius. So your melting point could melt anywhere from 48 to 184 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. Now that's a big, that's a big range. Okay, that's a big range. And so you're wondering, well, what do I do? Well, it might take you two or three tries to get a good melting point, but don't worry, you'll get it. What you would wanna do is you would just wanna kinda of heat it up quickly at first and let it melt, okay? And just get a rough idea of where it melts. Okay, you want to heat it up very quick, quickly, maybe use a ramp rate and, uh, you know, something faster than one to two degrees Celsius per minute um, and just get an idea, a ballpark of where it melts. Then you want to prepare a new sample or you'd probably prepare two samples to begin with. And then you would um, cool the instrument down until it's about 10 degrees Celsius lower than where it began to melt. Okay, and then you would do a slow ramp one to two degrees Celsius and get an accurate melting point. Okay, if you're not really understanding what I'm saying here, if you go into the textbook, your lab manual, which you're supposed to read, okay, it gives you more detail about that, what to do if you had an unknown compound, all right? So data collection, you're gonna record the identity of your compound in the notebook. You're always gonna record a melting point range. So whether it's a known or an unknown, if it's known, you write down the name of the compound. If it's an unknown, you write unknown number 10, unknown number eight, whatever, okay? You write down a range. You put in your units of degrees Celsius. Don't leave that out. Okay, I saw people measuring RFs and they put 
numbers in their lab notebook, no mil no millimeters, no centimeters. You want to make sure you always include units. And then when you're done with your capillary, even though there's a tiny bit of organic compound in there, you're just going to throw the used capillary tube with a little bit of melted compound in there in the broken glass container. Okay. We have one in the instrumentation room where we have the digimelt, and we also have a broken glass container in the main lab room as well. Never remelt the sample, right? Never remelt the sample because you've broken down the crystal lattice, and the book goes into more detail about why you should never remelt the sample. It can decompose, anyhow. Um, there we go. So, what do you have to do before you come to the lab? Okay, so instead of sending me an email, what the hell do I do before I come to the lab, Mr. Dan? Well, here you go. This is what you're going to do for your pre lab. You're going to make sure to read the entire experiment. Okay, it doesn't take long. You want to pay attention to everything that it says about melting point. You're going to read Technique C, pages 22 to 25. You're going to cover Exercise C2, the melting point of an unknown solid. Gives you lots of details about melting an unknown solid. If I left any stone unturned, I'm sure it's it's in there. You're going to look on page 27 for the list of all the unknowns. You're going to be inside one of that big list. Okay, so you're not going to have to melt every darn thing in that list. We don't have that kind of time. Read my Voice, okay, you can't see my face, but read my voice. You do not have to include all the compounds from table 1C-1 in your table of reagents. You don't have to include any of them, okay? There's quite a few of them in there. There's more, you know, there's probably 15 or something. And so you don't have to include all those. I'm going to tell you which compounds you need to include in your, uh, in your uh, reagent table. In part 3.3C, you're going to determine the melting points of the four compounds in table 3.3-4 on page 196. Okay, so if you go over to that page in your lab manual, you'll see that there are four compounds there. There's meta-anisic acid, there's resorcinol, there's para-anisic acid, and hydroquinone. The structures of these molecules, I have them in the slides in a few minutes. We'll take a look at them. But those four compounds are going to go into your table of reagents. Okay. Now, with respect to procedure, Mr. Dion, if I'm just measuring a melting point on four known compounds, and then I'm going to measure the melting point on an unknown, I might have to take it a couple of times to get a good melting point, but whatever. I'm doing the same thing over and over. Do I have to write the procedure out six times for the same thing? The answer is no. Okay. I want you to write down one good melting point procedure that you can use. For all of the four unknowns, or sorry, the four knowns and your unknown. Okay, so just one good procedure. And Miss uh, Miss Herring, Mr. Mayor, and I are going to come around just like we did in all the other labs, and we're going to check your pre lab to make sure that you are prepared, that you know how to take a melting point. You're not just walking in and saying, I'll just rely on those instructions on the digi melt. No, no, you need to come up with a good set of instructions before you come in. Okay, remember to include the start and the end for each melting point taken. Then for technique C2, you're going to take your assigned unknown, you're going to get a melting point of that unknown, and you're going to be able to identify that unknown um, based off of um, uh, based off its melting point, uh, looking at table 1C-1. Okay, again, you don't have to put everything in that table into your table of reagents. That would be way too much work. So in the first part, experiment 3.3C, where you measure the melting point of the four compounds that go into your table of reagents, you work by yourself, no collaboration required. You're going to determine the melting point of those four compounds. They're all knowns, but you're going to see, you know, how your melting points stack up to literature values. In the second part, when you identify your unknown, again, you work by yourself, don't have to have a partner, nice independent work, um, and you're going to identify an unknown. Okay. What, do you, what else do you have to have ready for the pre -lab? Standard header on the top of every page. It's another thing I noticed some of my students, and this isn't directed towards any individual. I don't remember what happened exactly in the lab, but I noticed I looked at a few students' notebooks and they had good uh, good purpose, good table of reagents, good procedure, but they would leave out the header. They wouldn't have it filled in. I don't know if they planned on going back and doing it later, but it only takes a minute, write down the name of the experiment, uh, you know, date, et cetera, et cetera, write down the purpose. Know that you're identifying or you're measuring, uh, huh. you're measuring the melting point of four knowns, right? You're checking the melting point of four knowns 
and then you're going to identify an unknown based off of its melting point. Excuse me. Um, let's see. You don't have to include any theory. Right in the third person. So that means there shouldn't be any, I did this, I'm going to do that. Mary did this, Joe did that. No, you just, everything is written in the third person. Melt the compound, you know, uh, set up the digimelt, prepare sample. You know, nothing has to be, I'm going to go prepare the sample. I'm going to wear, you know, my lab coat, none of that kind of stuff. Anyhow, there we go. Um, table of reagents. Put the compounds, the four compounds, okay? The four compounds I just mentioned, the um, anisic acid, Sorry, the meta anisic acid, the resorcinol, the para anisic acid, and the hydroquinone. You need those four compounds. Those are the only ones you need in there. Um, put in the appropriate physical properties. We talked about a lot that a lot during the first lab lecture, so I'm not going to review all that. What else? For those four solids, I want you to classify them in the table of reagents according to their polarity. I want you to classify those four compounds as either being nonpolar, moderately polar, or polar. I'm not going to tell you the answer. I want you to figure that out. Okay, safety. I noticed that some of my students were really, you know, they, they just put the safety in the table of reagents. We like it when you put a separate safety table because I find that oftentimes, and again, this isn't directed towards any one student, but oftentimes when students try to uh, put the safety in the table of reagents, they'll leave important things out and say, I don't have enough room, so I'll just put a couple things, a couple of words here. So make sure you have a separate safety table. Be sure to include a reference for your safety table. And for your table of reagents, there's no limiting reactant calculation. We're not doing a reaction um, procedure. You know, students, again, like to ask me, where did the procedure come from? It comes from a variety of places. It comes from the textbook, it comes from the lecture slides, and it also comes from this presentation that you're listening to right now. The data sheet's provided. Uh, it's posted in Canvas. I think I posted it in DocX, so if you want to fill it out, you know, in Word, be my guest. In fact, we encourage you to to uh, type up your results in discussion, it's much easier to read. Anyhow, these are the four compounds that you're looking at in part 3.3c, okay? You're gonna um, obtain the melting point of these four compounds. Now, if you're asking me, this video, that's a lot of compounds. Uh, it's gonna take me a long time. Am I gonna be in there all day melting things? Well, um, generally what I do with my students is I'll ask my students to, to take the melting point of two compounds. I'll give them two compounds and say, Take the melting point of those two. Having said that, since we're down to only nine students per lab, if you have time and you feel like you want to take the melting point of all four, you can do that. But what I would ask you to do is take the melting point of only two, the two that we give you first, do the unknown, and then if there's time, come back and you're like, this should be on. I can't sleep unless I do all four of these compounds. No problem. If we have time, you're more than welcome to take all the melting points. If you only have time to take two of them and then you're unknown, you're going to have to borrow data from another student in the class. Use their melting point. Okay? Now, in your discussion, you're going to have to justify the melting points of these four compounds based on their structures. You know, you can see they're all aromatic compounds. Right? You see that the meta anisic acid and the para anisic acid, these are carboxylic acids, right? So they have carboxyl groups, right? You should know the functional group of carboxylic acid. Okay, um, on the anisic acid and the para-anisic acid, we also have an ether down here. Notice that the substitution pattern on these two acids is different though, right? You see that the carboxyl group on them is, you know, we have a 1,3 substitution in the meta-anisic acid, and we have a 1,4 substitution in the para-anisic acid. Now, most of you probably haven't learned what meta and para is because you're probably just starting out in organic chemistry with me. But I can help you out on that just very quickly. I can show you that in two shakes of a lamb's tail. If you have a di-substituted benzene derivative, so if you have, you know, a substituent X and a substituent Y, if they're in this 1-2 arrangement to each other, we call that ortho. So we say they're ortho to each other, or we just use the letter O. When they're one, three to each other, like this, okay, so if you had your X and Y, three, three, this, okay, if you had your X and Y, and they're one, three, like this, okay, then we call that meta, so that's where I came to that word meta, M-E-T-A, or we just use the letter M, 
And if they are one four, so I'll redraw it down here because we don't have anything. Um, if you had your X and your Y and they're one four from each other, and I mean counting the carbons, one, two, three, four, then you call that para. Okay? Uh, para, like this. I went to graduate school with a French girl, and her last name was Para. Uh, her name was Stephanie Para. She, her best friend's name was Stephanie Para, so we called her Stephanie Para and Stephanie Ortho. Anyhow, um, so we have the meta anisic acid, the para anisic acid. Then we have these two compounds over here, hydroquinone and resorcinol. Notice that both of these compounds, the only functional groups they have are hydroxyls. Okay? They have hydroxyls, but they're in different positions, aren't they? The hydroxyls in the hydroquinone are para, and in resorcinol, they're meta. So I want you to be sure to read the lab manual textbook, and I want you to go into the chapter one of Klein and make sure you look over intermolecular forces, things like London forces, dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, and see if you can use that knowledge to help you justify or rationalize the difference in the melting points between or the difference in melting points between these four compounds. We'll talk about it a little bit more. So right here. Now, what are the intermolecular forces that you can see in these molecules? Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on intermolecular forces. All of you have either taken organic chemistry one or are currently enrolled in chemistry 31 along with me, and all of you have passed general chemistry. You should be able to go to the science center or meet a friend online, you know, during a pandemic, and you should be able to explain intermolecular forces to another student. So if you need a refresher on dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces, be sure to do that. So you should be able to look at those molecules and evaluate which of these intermolecular forces do they have. And then our textbook talks about symmetry. Okay, the textbook alludes to symmetry a couple of times. And if you do all the reading, you'll see the word symmetry come up. Well, what does that really mean? Now, this is um, something that I, I'm not sure who it might be, Mr. Mayor, it might be Mr. Geiger, kind of put this concept together because maybe some students were uh, confused about the idea of symmetry. But when we're talking about packing molecules, right, you, you heard me say the word crystalline lattice probably 20 times today. What does that mean? Okay, it's how, efficient, how efficiently can we pack the molecules together, right? The shape of these molecules must have some kind of effect on how efficiently we can pack them together. So I want you to think about that when you're trying to justify their melting points. Okay? It says here, what about stacking instead of symmetry? Let's say we had a molecule that looks like this. This is called napoline. You take two benzene rings kind of and you fuse them together. And if you're in my 3101 class, we'll talk about napoline later on. But for now, it's good enough. You have two benzene stuck together. You see how it's a planar molecule? Well, if they're all stacked together efficiently, the melting point is going to be around 80 to 82 degrees Celsius. But what happens when you throw an impurity in there? It's going to disrupt that packing. They're going to pack, but not nearly as efficiently, and it lowers the melting point. So you can borrow from that um, stacking concept, looking at the structures of these four compounds, looking at their intermolecular forces. And I bet you, I know, that if you think about it hard enough and you study it, you're going to be able to come up with a good rationale as to why these four compounds, you know, one of them has the highest melting point, one of them has the lowest melting point, and two of the others are somewhere in the middle. And again, I want you to explain to me, or the grader, your grader, why that is. So once you're done at the lab, this lab is one of the labs that I would say is not very messy. You know, we don't make a huge mess in here because the only chemicals we use are small amounts in the capillary. But just make sure everything's put away when you're done. Make sure the sinks are, are cleaned up. Yesterday, my students did a pretty good job of cleaning up the lab, I thought, anyhow. Um, you know, you can always ask your instructor before you leave to say, hey, Miss Herring, Mr. Mayor, is there anything else you know you need me to do before you leave? And they'll say, oh, you know, you dropped something. I don't know, anyhow. Um, complete the data sheet, calculate the percent error of all the melting points. We'll look at the data sheet in a second uh, before we end the lab lecture. Uh, a single temperature literature value. Ah, I get one for you. Okay, so if you look at table... Um, 1C-1 on page 27. I'm sure some of you have been looking at there while you're listening to this lab lecture. You'll see that the melting point is one value. It's just one number. That number represents the upper value of the range. So when you're calculating um, the uh, percent error, 
you're going to use the upper value of your range when you're comparing it to the melting point. Okay. Um, it says page C page 634 for this equation, but I have it right here. This is just a sample calculation. Say you have a compound. It's got a literature melting point of 122.4. This is your range, 119 to 121.5. Your experimental error is going to be the absolute value between the upper melting point of your range. Subtract the literature value divided by the accepted value of the literature value multiplied by 100. And be sure to be careful with your sig figs, you know. Uh, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to say, hey, four sig figs. No, 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 no. When you take 122.4 and you subtract 121.5, you only get one sig fig. So one sig fig divided by four sig figs still gives you one sig fig. Okay? So make sure you're Johnny on the spot with your significant figures. All right. Um, observation. I mean, some of this doesn't really apply to us, but I want you to hear me out because we're almost done. So just bear with me a few more minutes. Observations. Yesterday when I was in the lab with my students, and again, this isn't directed towards any particular student, but I saw quite a few students writing just their initials and then check marks and things like that. That is acceptable some of the time, but not all of the time. Okay. Usually you can make an observation about what's going on in your procedure. Okay. Now, the whole thing about solvents and TLC mobile phase and hot plate settings, that's not really important in our lab, but maybe you might see, maybe you see a color change or, you know, phase changes. So try to be not a thesis, okay? But let's try to include all important observations because trust me, your grader is going to be able to read your report and she or he is going to know what you should have seen when you did that. And if you missed out on something that was pertinent, you know, a very pertinent observation, you will lose points if that's not included. Okay. Another thing is experimental error. Um, don't try to give us any experimental improvements. I know that in some classes they might be, give me a way that we can improve this experiment. I don't care about that. Um, try to identify actual errors in the experiment. Anyhow, all right. Let's take a quick look at the data sheet and then we'll move on with life. Okay, so here's the data sheet. Again, I have it posted to Canvas for your kind perusal. You have um, the four knowns for a part 3.3. See, you're going to write down your melting point ranges. Here are the literature melting points here. You're going to calculate the percent error for all these. We are going to check those. Okay, we are going to, you're like, what? You're not going to check my math for all four of them. Oh, yes, we are. Okay, we're going to check your math for all of them. Then for your unknown, you're going to write down its name. Okay, so which one it was from that table, 1C-1. Um, or sorry, you're going to put down its melting point. Then you write down the ID number, then you write down the name, you put in a percent error, and there you go. We want you to show the calculations for the percent errors in meta acid. acid. Um, double check your math, double check your sig figs, and this is a, the big part of the lab. doesn't look like a lot of words here, and it's not, but this is the whole point of taking the melting points of those four compounds in 3.3c, is that we want you to discuss and rationalize these melting points those four compounds okay, that I've gone over several times today in terms of their symmetry, polarity, and intermolecular forces. So again, I want you to come up with a rationale as to why they have different melting points. Now, if I look over some old lab reports from some of my older students, you know, sometimes it was anywhere between three to five paragraphs usually. And I don't mean three to five essays. I just mean three to five short paragraphs where the students were able to, you know, justify the difference in melting point. Okay? Um, yeah, there we go. So um, that's really all I have to say about um, melting points. Are there any questions? I haven't been paying attention to the chat back here. Are there any burning questions or melting questions? Okay. Well, I'm not done yet. I just want to do one more quick thing here. Uh, one second. Just give me one second here.